All right, so to close off, accountability. Speaking of accountability, in the next five years, where can we see yourself, whether it be your business or your newly found art career, <laughs> where can we see you? In the next five years, if, if I'm operating on a high level, well, when I am operating on a high level, you won't see me. You'll feel me, but you won't see me. All right, Donnie, yes, how you been? I've been, man, I've been. I've been, uh, I've been good. I'm always good, you know, just navigating through the challenges like everybody yeah, right now yeah. and just trying to figure it out, man, what's next, you know? Yes. Okay, so today we have a very special guest on The Manifest Episode 2, where we connect with a bunch of business owners, entrepreneurs, and creatives, and just have genuine conversations and just see how much value we can gain out of the conversation. Um, last episode, we had Connor, someone that you've obviously trained in the past. So let's talk about from the beginning. Obviously, you've transitioned from CFL to now a strength coach. How was that transition coming up? And was this something that you saw yourself doing after your career? Uh, transition is a good word I mean to describe what it's been like you know I I was uh, you know if I'm being honest I was one of those um, student athletes at the time that I was always aware of life after football um, you know I was very fortunate that uh, you know my my parents made me very aware of that a lot of the coaches I had had a very positive influence um, on me and on my career and being aware and thinking about okay life after football life after football but that's something that um, you hear about it you can know it but it's a difficult thing to prepare and really understand until you actually go through it so you know it was one of those things where um, you know I went to university I had to, to work my butt off to get to university then when I was there that was actually what I think helped me was my work ethic um, you know, I, I don't think of myself as one of those just naturally gifted scholastic <laughs> kids yeah. or, or was at the time, but um, I put a lot of time and effort into, you know, doing that. And uh, my initial plan was, I mean, I was talented with um, uh, an ability to do artwork, painting on canvas um, and other, uh, other, other sources. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, trying to use that talent that I had, that God-given talent that I had, that I also worked and, and uh, cultivated. Um, I, uh, I went to university, studied fine arts and art history, and my plan was really to become an art history teacher. Um, <clears throat> and then from there, have been a, ch a chance to either, you know, coach football or soccer or basketball, something along those lines. Yeah. Um, and then really what happened was, then I had this opportunity to, you know, I excelled in university uh, athletically and had the opportunity then to go to the CFL and play. Um, had a nice, uh, a pretty good career as far as uh, longevity in the career. Uh, and then, you know, it was really two, two, uh, two major injuries I had as far as, uh, when I say major, um, the timing of them was probably the worst timing for me, possible. You know, my first, uh, I had complete ACL reconstruction on my right knee uh, in my senior year of high school, which is pretty detrimental. That impacted recruiting and, and my opportunities and options, which uh, we'll probably get into down the road, but which led me in a certain direction. But really what happened was I took a lot of self-accountability from that and then started digging into how to rehab myself, figuring that out. At the time, I'm going to date myself a little bit, but at the time it wasn't as simple as just typing in Google ACL and 10,000 articles will come up. This one I had to actually go read books, look into the library and, and research What's it. the library? We don't yeah, even know right? what that is no more. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the first one. Uh, the second one was then in my, um, I think it was my fourth year as a professional athlete. Um, I went from having, you know, what I would refer to as all the chips on my table. Um, I was going into my freezing year. I was a uh, starting Canadian corner, which 
you know, was uh, there was not many at the time. Um, you know, I had some different opportunities that, that were brewing from that, and that was, I think, my third or fourth year in, in the CFL. And then tore my other ACL. So within a single uh, solitary moment, my entire situation flipped, and now it went from having all the chips being in a strong negotiation in the offseason as a free agent to now trying to figure it out. Um, so those two major uh, setbacks or obstacles, whatever term you want to use, are really the two things I think that really shaped my uh, future. Um, I look now as I reflect back on those, there were, those were probably the two uh, or two of the biggest uh, athletic setbacks as far as um, injuries go. But those are probably two of the catalysts that move me forward to the situation I'm in, I'm in now. Talk about the, talk about that a little bit. Sorry to cut you off, but talk about the transition of your your rolling. You know, your athletic career is going well, and similar to what's happening now with the pandemic, a lot of businesses have been thriving the past few years, and now there's this shift. How did you deal with that, like mentally, from everything's going your way, now you have these injuries? How, where is your head at during those times? Uh, well, like I said, they were two very different times of my life. My first one was my senior year in high school. So, you know, I was whatever I was, 17 years old at the time. Um, and, you know, to be blatant about it, mentally, it, 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 uh, it crushed me, you know, it, it destroyed me at the time. Um, I don't like to attach any labels to, to things for myself. But if, you know, you could talk about being depressed or, or on the verge of that, that's, that's where I would have been at that time. Um, and, you know, I had everything was rolling. I was, you know, every other day talking to schools on recruiting, you know, some big time schools. Um, you know, and I was at that stage deciding, do I want to pursue soccer? Do I want to pursue basketball? Or do I want to pursue football? And football was really number three on my list at the time. Um, and I was garnering attention for all of those things. And then, boom, just like that, you know, I went from the first game of my senior year, uh, you know, rushing for 300 plus yards to game two. And I have these, you know, scouts that are at the game coming to watch. And then, you know, second time I touched the ball, about to break it open, tear my ACL. So, um, you know, it, uh, it mentally just crushed me at the time because I didn't know really what was on the other side of that um, you know ACL I didn't know what that meant I don't know what those three letters meant and there was like I said there was not the same resources um, to reach out to somebody or to figure out like hey am I gonna be okay from this can I identify with somebody else that's been through this so you know I just went into the shell and then you know the doctors like well we'll repair you but you know at best you might be able to play um, you know uh, what do you call it? Uh, not extracurricular, but uh, not not compete at a high level, essentially. Um, weekend warrior. Weekend warrior. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, which for me, being very focused at a young age on my goal was I didn't grow up wanting to be Spider-Man or Batman or a firefighter. I wanted to be a professional athlete. Yeah. And uh, that wasn't just a thing I said, that was something I actively pursued through my, um, you know, my daily activities, right? And uh, that just, it just, it crushed me until finally, you know, a couple months, a couple months after, my mom just finally was like, literally just smacked me in the face like, okay, hey, enough feeling sorry for yourself. If you want to come back and play, you want to do that, then figure out a way and get it done. Mm -hmm. But sitting here moping around is not going to get the job done. Mm -hmm. And, you know, literally that next day I got up and I went and, uh, you know, I tried to start running and doing stuff. And uh, that really was the moment that, you know, I started to make that conscious decision of like, OK, I'll again prove prove this this um, this idea wrong and pursue this idea and can continue to stay on my my path or what my vision was at the time and what were you doing to rehab yourself obviously you said you didn't have the resources that you did have now so what were the steps that you were taking to rehab yourself 
Uh, well, I mean, it was it was real simple to be honest. Now, again, at the time, the knowledge that I had was not nowhere near what I have now. The uh, availability for resources was nowhere near what it is now. So, as a 17, a 17 year old with this leg that's you know shrunk down, my speed is not the same. My ability to jump is not the same. What am I going to do? And I just did what I knew how to do. And part of what my father um, guided me at is I just started training. Now, whether it was the most efficient way or not, you know, who knows? But at 17, I just did what I thought I could do. And I'd see commercials of, you know, different athletes doing stuff. So I have this uh, hill um, back, uh, back in Hamilton. And uh, it's, uh, it's called DeWitt Hill. So anybody from back there would, would recognize that name. And uh, it's about a two kilometer increase up into the escarpment mm -hmm. of, uh, of Hamilton. So it's just around the corner from my house. So that used to be a hill I would go run, you know, for training for my conditioning and these types of things. And then that became my new goal. It's like, yeah, hey, I'm going to go run that mountain. Uh, I, I call it a mountain, but um, run that hill. And uh, so literally the next day I went from just like walking and trying to do these exercises to like, no, I'm going to get to the top. Mm -hmm. And um, probably metaphorically, it, it also inspired me a lot of ways. Um, and then I, I did that. So I went the next day and I just started running this steady incline um, to get to the top of the escarpment. And that was day one, you know, and then I started doing things. I mean, I would at the time, my high school was around the corner from my house. So I would, uh, you know, hop over the barbed wire fence, grab tires, chuck those tires yeah. from the automotive uh, classes. Yeah. You know, I'd get this piece of, uh, uh, like electrical tape and this uh, rope from my dad. My dad was an electrician and I'd tie that around my waist, tie it around the tires that I'd do sprints on the high school field. Mm -hmm. And um, again, I wasn't following any programming or anything. I was just working hard and just putting that work in, which is what it all boils down to at the end of the day anyways, you know? And um, yeah, and I just started, you know, focusing on my, my nutrition a lot more and just continuously smash that into my head that I will come back, I will come back, I will be, be better, I will be the best, etc, etc. And that's, uh, that's where, where I, I started off. So now we're in high school, we fast forward to university, about to go to the CFL, but go to the next level. What was, like in comparison to high school, do you think doing all that self rehab, like that isolation of, okay, I have no other option, do you think that helped you when you got to university and then trying to make it to um, the next level, whether that be the NFL or the CFL? What was that like? Yeah, for, for me, I mean, I've always prided myself on, I mean, I've all, obviously, uh, and it's important for me to acknowledge, I've always been fortunate to have um, some God-given athletic talents mm -hmm. um, that, uh, but I always approached my mental, like my thing was combining and, or finding that synergy between my mental preparation, my mental game, my mental strength, and my physical attributes, mm -hmm. and trying to find where that mesh point was, mm -hmm. and then using both of those things. That's been something, you know, it's probably um, an innate ability I think I had. Like I don't think at the time I was very conscious of that, but it was something that I was always, always pursuing. And, you know, work ethic is the thing that you can control, right? Um, your effort, your output, your energy, are those are the things that you are able to control. So those things I, I grabbed by the horns and I just poured everything into, into those things. And my whole objective was where I drew a lot of my confidence from, I think, was from me being aware or even playing games in my own brain that nobody else is, is doing these things that I'm doing. I'm sure there were, but in my head, that's what I fueled myself on. And that's how I, um, yeah, you know, that's where the nutrients to my brain, to my body came from, was me believing that nobody else was running at this time. Nobody else was doing as much uh, work as I was doing. Um, nobody else was getting up and you know, doing those things that you don't necessarily want to do or are not the comfortable things to do should, is probably a better way of, um, of articulating that, but doing what's required. And that is something that I still stand on to this day when people talk about, 
you know, the grind, the grind, especially athletes. It doesn't resonate with me with athletes when they're talking about oh, I'm on my grind right now. Now <laughs> that'll uh, that'll uh, that'll offend probably a lot of people, yeah. but uh, it's just how I. It's it's not even how I think. It's what I believe mm -hmm. through my blood. Like as an athlete, <clears throat> you have an opportunity. You uh, you get to do that. You get to do this. You know you have a certain amount of athletic ability that. You know, from my perspective, God's touched you with and said, okay, here, now do something with it. It's not a grind. Uh, but it's simply doing what's required. And the simple part is the most difficult part, right? Mm -hmm. Every single person knows what to do. Mm -hmm. It's a question of your ability to execute it, not today, not tomorrow, the next day, the next day, the next day. And that's where you start to see this separation occur. So for me, at the university level, bring it back to your question, is that fuel um, is what, what really serviced me and serviced my engine through my university. Is I just had this massive chip on my shoulder when I was in university um, to just execute at a, such a high level that it, it was absurd that you would think about lighting up against me. And that was just my, my mental approach to, uh, to the game athletically. And what do you think is the difference between now and then? Like you talk about athletes now when they talk about, oh, I'm on my grind. And then the things that you've put yourself through leading up to your pro career, career and obviously now, what do you think the biggest difference is from that time and currently? Uh, I, think, I think now... <clears throat> The, I think the biggest difference is that now more and more people, athletes, are able to observe different people doing things and then follow those paths, mm -hmm. which I don't think is a bad thing, but it's, it's like they say, uh, you know, mimicking is, um, or, or copying, right, is a form of flattery, mm -hmm. and, and that is, but it's, there's got to be a certain authenticness to mm -hmm. what you do for in your heart, I think. And as, as fluff as that might sound to some people, I just think that that's where it is. It's like, oh, I see OBJ doing one-handed catches, so I'm going to go and do one-handed catches all day. And that's all cool. That's smooth because you're going to have that potential opportunity where that one-handed catch mm -hmm. will service you. But have you spent enough time working on the fundamentals of catching with two hands? And have you done that until your hands are bleeding, until your hands are callous from catching the right way? Because if you watch any professional game, any university game, any high school game, right, those highlight catches are one every what, right? And I think that that's where is we see so much of the end result now, and we miss so much of the middle that I think it starts to become like, oh, well, if I just do that, that, and that, then this is going to happen. And uh, I think that's where I think the biggest separation is. I think there's a lot of positives to that as well, because, you know, you as an athlete can say, okay, I want to get to this level. Here's the steps that I've got to take. And you can actually visually see them, as opposed to, I think, you know, years and years ago where here's the end result, I want to be a professional, here's where I am, I'm 16 or 17 years old in high school, and I've torn my ACL, how am I going to get there? I don't know, because I don't, I don't see it. It happens, but you don't see it. And I think that's really where, you know, part of the biggest difference is, uh, is, is now. And then you're seeing these guys talking about, oh, this, I'm on my grind, I'm on my this, I'm on my this, and which is cool. But that's... Uh, there's just, it's the words, man. It's all the words. Yeah. It's the catch words. It's the flashy words. And that's what we're all after right now is what's the catchy word? What's the thing to say as opposed to, you know, you earning that language, mm -hmm. that makes sense. So now you're in university at Laurier. You're playing football, obviously. How is the academic side of things? I know you talked about going into arts. And when you first told me arts, I know a lot of my homeboys, like, they – go to arts because it's the easiest thing to do and I was trying to do some background research on you and you know you had some features um, while you're in university on your artistic skills and I actually saw some of your drawings and I was like whoa what the hell like he can actually draw draw where did that come from in uh, throughout your time 
Uh, I mean, that part, uh, my artistic uh, talent, ability, um, skills, those, I mean, they definitely come from my father. Again, I was, again, very fortunate. I think I was blessed with some artistic talent. Um, I had to cultivate it as well. Uh, but I mean, from a very young age, my parents, I think, recognized and my teachers recognized that I just saw things differently, you know. Um, I think back to, um, as I say, I think back. At the time, I didn't know, but uh, my parents, um, or my grade one or, or two teacher, I think, had, had sent some of my work home and said, just the way that I'm observing and then transitioning the thoughts onto paper at that age are very different than so many of the other kids, you know. Um, and I mean, I can think back to lessons my father teaching me of, you know, okay, we're going to draw this, you know, live uh, or still matter, still subject matter, uh, still life is what they would call it. And uh, so, you know, he set up these apples in a, on a bowl, for example, and you draw it, which is stuff I don't enjoy doing. It's, to me, it's boring. Um, I shouldn't say boring, but, uh, but it's, uh, it doesn't interest me. Mm -hmm especially as a six or seven year old but for my dad it was like okay draw it and what do most kids do they pick up a red marker and they draw a red apple right or my dad was like no that's that's not accurate it's look at it look at the apple and see the colors and then you start to really look in it and then going from looking to actually observing and seeing oh yeah there's some yellow in there there's some brown there's some green so all of a sudden, I was really observing things in a way different capacity and being um, stimulated to look at things that way, which I think are, are things I've carried with me through my whole, whole life. And so that's really, I think, what initially for, for myself anyways, um, is what really triggered it and that stuck out in my head. And um, yeah, I've just always been drawing things. I started off drawing, you know, um, athletic things all the time, sporting things, and then uh, when I got to high school, um, you know, the teachers challenged me to use my talents outside of sports mm -hmm. because sports is the, the thing that I knew and I, I loved, right? So then I started to really veer outside of sports, um, which again was another challenge for me, but it really stimulated and unlocked something else in my brain that I started, you know, being able to... Um, uh, you know, produce these pieces that uh, drew on different aspects of people and made, you know, you, the observer, look at it in a different type of way. So that w became the, uh, the new interest to me. Uh, and then I got to university and uh, my university, um, my university career, I think it really helped me, you know, blossom and see things in a different way as well. Uh, I think initially, my initial um, my initial relationship in that faculty wasn't the, the greatest, uh, but I think it was something that, for me, um, it really triggered me to, again, prove myself, which is what I feel like I'm always trying to do, and I'm okay with that. Uh, but yeah, my, uh, initial, uh, my initial welcome into the arts when I had transferred to, uh, to Laurier, the, uh, the professor at the time, was like, I think kind of took a look at me and thought like, oh, if you think this is going to be a course just to, you know, cruise through so you can play football, you have another thing coming. And I just ate that one initially mm -hmm. and uh, because the teacher didn't know me. She was making judgments just on my appearance, how my hair was, yeah. you know, my background of football, whatever connotation that was and thinking like, what's this football player doing mm -hmm. in my art class? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, which I embraced those opportunities all the time mm -hmm. and uh, didn't take too long for her to realize that I was the guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and how was that, like, because I would think you being able to draw, it's like another form of therapy, right? And you're playing such a rigorous sport every single day, probably two a days, and then you have games on weekends. And a lot of athletes, from my experience, don't really have an escape from their sport it's just basketball is all they know football is all they know and then the school part is just kind of there so how was it mentally just like being able to have that escape okay you go from practice banging on guys and then you go whether to your room or to class and it's not really 
something that you you're just supposed to be there but it's it's therapy okay you're you're escaping that do you think your university experience would have been harder if it wasn't for arts or do you think it would have been the same uh i think it would have been this i mean for me i didn't i didn't enjoy school mm -hmm. i didn't enjoy the scholastic portion of school I, I wasn't naturally like I said good at those things mm -hmm. um, but I knew the relevance of them and I understood the importance of them mm -hmm. and you know my I think back to my the storytelling here but I think back to and like I said at the start of this conversation I'm very fortunate I've had you know some really solid people impact my life at different moments and they're very vivid moments to me and I think to my grade 10 basketball teacher who you know pretty much literally yanked me out of out of the cafeteria by my ear and brought me up three flights of stairs and sat me in his room and he's like you have this skill set and ability to do something with your athletics and instead you're you're dwindling it away running around with this crew mm -hmm instead of focusing on this. At some point, you're either gonna be going one way or the other direction. Mm. That's definitely condensed part of that yeah. conversation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it just, it just resonated with me at the time, is like, this is what's happening, here's where I wanna go, and I had a decision to make. You know, and I started off in, in basic and general courses, you know. Um, I wasn't supposed to go to university and my grade, you know, eight teacher had, had said that, you know, in a, in a parent-teacher interview with, to my mother, like, Donnie's not going to, you know, go to university. In so, grade eight? In grade eight. Jeez. Might have been in grade seven. But yeah. nonetheless, you know, and you hear that as a kid, so you're like, okay, well, the teacher knows best, so that's probably what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and my my uh, my mother and father just never let me. They just never let me settle. It was just not an option. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> you know, so I obviously then had to find a way to use my athletics, use my artwork, or my art skills to help me go. And you're right, the fact that I did have that ability, I think, was a major. Um, component of me staying dialed in because I didn't like school I didn't want to go to school I mean I was at university looking around being like I'm not like these other students mm -hmm. for multiple reasons but I'm here and I have a job to do I want to be you know the first one to have a university degree in my entire family and you know I want to pursue the option of uh, playing professional sports so those were stronger, um, those two things drove me stronger than a lot of the other stuff, you know, that I navigated my, my uh, life through. Um, and it definitely was a, the art was definitely an outlet for me, um, you know, because football was such a different um, emotional frequency for me that you know, I would have to turn a switch on. I wouldn't have to, but I did. I turned a switch on to behave, operate, perform the game of football at a high level a certain type of way. And then you come off the field and, you know, you turn the switch off. It's not that simple. But conceptually, that's what you do. But I would, like you said, have this other switch that I could turn on as well to then transition me through there. It's not like I would just stop and have no other skills which I was very fortunate for um, so it definitely helped me I think a lot um, I think where it, it helped me probably the most was when football was over because now that outlet was you know gone and now it was like what do I do with with all this shit <laughs> yeah, yeah. right where do I go with it you know I've, sp I've spent my whole life since I was you know six or seven or eight years old focused on this one vision and what it takes to perform at that level and then all of a sudden that's gone okay now go be a normal person or a, an everyday person or go function and not enough people I think talk about how difficult that is I, I don't mean that from a sob position or from a like poor me is not what I mean. It's just you're going from like operating at a high frequency, high voltage, mm -hmm. to come back and then just you know just operate normal. 
Yeah, and I was just gonna ask you that. So athletes, whether you're an athlete going through university or at the pro level, if you could go back prepping yourself for the end of your athletic career, how would you have changed things? Um, whether that be in university, planning for something else, doesn't necessarily have to be like academically, but how do you mentally prep yourself for that end? Uh, that's, I think, my uh, part of my ongoing work now. Like a lot of the athletes that I work with, especially the professional athletes uh, or the university, uh, the guys that have a, a legit opportunity, um, part of our conversations and I ask them, so what's the extra strategy? You know, and there's a couple athletes I've worked with where I've started with them on day one just on the, the client, the, the intake or the consultation and I'm asking them, so what's your exit strategy? And they're looking at me with this blank face like, what are you talking about? I'm like, well, like when you're done playing, whether it's, you know, some of the basketball pros that I work with, the lacrosse professional athletes or the football guys. And, you know, here they are excited, pumped, you know, just make it into the league and you're one, uh, a rookie or year two. And here I am saying, I want you to Tell me what you're thinking about when it's all done. What's your plan? And <clears throat> that's coming from them, as, from me as a strength coach. But that's again coming to them not as their strength coach, as their coach with experience in that situation. You must throw a lot of people off, like with that question. Absolutely, right? And and you get guys kind of thinking, like, well, what are you talking about? And I'm like, well, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What yeah. are you talking about? Because I'm just asking the question, you yeah. know. And and it's it's not semantics, but it's I want you to be thoughtful about what happens when it's all done, mm -hmm. because no matter for most guys and 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 girls as well. By the time you are in this situation to be a professional, you're at the youngest, you know, 23, 24. Mm -hmm. And majority, not all, but a lot have played their sport or sports for their whole life. So from whenever you start, you know, my son started playing soccer at six years old, mm -hmm. something like that. So you're talking about 15 years plus, and now all of a sudden you're saying, well, when, is all, when it's all done, what are you gonna do? But the truth of the matter is how many guys and girls have 15 year professional careers like not a lot mm -hmm. right so the fact that you're thinking of that when you look at the average career for football for example is I think it's two to three years mm -hmm. is the average like so by the time you make it as a pro that clock is like ticking on you right now mm -hmm. every day and it's accelerating faster than it was when you were 17 mm -hmm. faster than it was when you were 19 in university and um, I think just getting people to think and be aware of that and then starting to put the pieces, um, small pieces in place. So now, when you are the professional athlete, and you know you have this event to go to, for example, and these are conversations, I'm not making these up, these are conversations I've had with other guys I've worked with, and you're going to you know, this event to go and sign autographs. You have two options, I mean there's multiple options, but two options, you can go there, because everybody wants to shake your hand, get a picture with you, mm -hmm. smile, sign autographs, and walk away from it like you did a good deed, which is great. Or you can go there, do that good deed, but also start to network, mm -hmm. start to you know use that little bit of status that you do get from in Canada, anyways, in the CFL. Um, but regardless, whatever, whatever sport it is, um, use that little bit of status to help network and position yourself. Because you obviously have a skill set, you obviously have something or else you'd not make it to the professional level. Now you've got to start to find how are you going to be able to transition, whether that's going to be in real estate, you're going to go into real estate after. Okay, start to develop some relationships now. Start to you know, find that mentor or mentors that you can start to work with now while you're playing that you can start to position yourself that that transition can be a little bit smoother because mine was not smooth at all. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it hit me like a ton of bricks and I knew it was coming. That's, that's the scary part for me when I work with athletes is this is coming, you know it's coming, you have time to, to get yourself, you know, um, somewhat prepared, at least professionally. You know, the yeah. mental and emotional thing, like that's gonna be a difficult thing for everybody. Because, you know, what the game of basketball means and meant to you is different than what the game of basketball means and meant to me. So that's where, you know, I really try to um, 
find ways to help you know guys and girls you know emotionally connect with what comes after and be aware of it because it, it comes it's relentless so what was your transition after the cfl leading up to where you are now um it was uh oh man as you asked that question i zipped through <laughs> a lot of years yeah. um well for one i wasn't uh i wasn't ready for it you know i knew it was coming like i said and and i i, I know i keep saying that but I knew it was coming. In my head, I was like, I have one more year I wanted to play. I wanted to get one more year under my belt and play. Uh, I was in Saskatchewan at the time. And uh, so I was like, hey, you know, my body is just not operating mm -hmm. at the same efficiency. I think I was 31 or 32 at the mm -hmm. time. So I had a long, you know, career as a defensive back. So in my head, I was like, hey, uh, this is going to be my last year and then I'll move on to something else. Mm -hmm. But anticipating I had that year. And uh, anyways, I went, I went to training camp, played in exhibition games, came out of the season or came out of the, uh, the start of the, uh, the start of the season. And then they just said, that's it, you're done. And so the first time I was cut was the last time I was cut <laughs> in my entire life. So that was something new for me to deal with. Um, and again, now it was like, okay, I had started doing a little bit of personal training at the time um, in my off season. So I had that, you know, kind of going, but then I was like, okay, I left. I went back home, went, um, went home to Hamilton, lived in Toronto for a little bit, and then decided, okay, I gotta, I'm done with the CFL, I'm done with football. Let me go in and start real life, so to speak. And uh, then I moved back to Ottawa because I felt that was just the best, uh, best move for me professionally for me to develop I think the best way and, and you didn't want to stay in Saskatchewan <laughs> I definitely didn't want to stay in Saskatchewan no disrespect yeah. but no it, it was nothing really for me there other than football mm -hmm. and, and uh, then when I went back home to Hamilton it just it just it wasn't the best environment for me to um, I think stay and develop myself professionally the way that I wanted to so left my friends um, and family and came back to Ottawa before you even go on, like, how hard is that? You know, we grow up where we're from, whether it be Ottawa, Toronto, in the States, wherever you're from, to up and leave after your career is done and you have the option to go back to your comfort zone. How hard was that of a transition to just leave what you know? Yeah, it was, uh, it was very difficult because, like you said, you know, I'm leaving everything that I know and now I'm at a very vulnerable position. I'm at probably you know, my, uh, yeah, my most vulnerable since leaving um, for, for university. And I'm leaving, like you said, the comforts. Um, now for me, that's also, I think, how I thrive is being uncomfortable, mm -hmm. being in discomfort. I don't like that, mm -hmm. like anybody, but I also thrive off of that. Um, and I think for me, I had to, that's what I had to do is force the next bit of growth on myself. And by doing that was like, no, you got to go and do it and be by yourself to figure it out. That's also a detrimental thing for me as well, uh, that I've continued to learn over the years. But for me, that was the way I felt I had to, to fly. So, uh, it was, it was difficult because, you know, you're now back into, um, I'm now a regular person in, in a city, and when I say regular person, meaning there's nothing, like nobody's coming up to me and asking me for an autograph, nobody's coming to watch me on Saturday mm -hmm. do anything anymore. So now, you know, those little perks or whatnot that you would get as the professional athlete, those are all gone. Mm -hmm. You know, I gotta wait in line just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. I gotta, um, you know, those kind of things, which, which is fine, it's just, it's different, right? You know, I call up, Hey, I got to get uh, this. Oh, do you have any tickets? I'm like, no, I don't have any tickets. Okay, well, uh, yeah, how about uh, two weeks from now? Mm. You know, okay, no problem. But that's just, these are just the realities, yeah. right? Um, and then, yeah, I was just trying to figure it out. And then I went back into my personal training. But I had left those clients, which they were all aware of at the time, that I'd be going away to play. So they all knew that. But then I came back. Mm. And people don't wait for you, right? People got other things they want to do. Mm. So now I came back to a business that wasn't existing. And so I literally was like starting back at ground zero of like, hey, I gotta go and build up my client list again. I gotta, so 
it was very challenging. And I mean, I, I remember at the time going out, I think I put about a 1,200 flyers out, you know, from at the time for, you know, my personal training um, services. And I didn't get any phone, a single phone call back. So now I'm sitting here waiting and now again, right? And financially, this is taking an impact. Emotionally, it's taking an impact. And it's like, well, I'm this person with this skill set, but I'm not being able to make that connection right now to get people to, to, to work with me. So um, I had to dabble into that. I got back into my artwork. Um, you know, I was going around trying to do that, um, having some art shows as well. And then I dabbled in some uh, real estate as well. Um, and just trying to figure out what I wanted to do. So I was wearing multiple hats at, at one point, um, hopping from this job, then I was at the bank, I was working, I went back into banking. I'm like, hey, now I've been out of the game f um, for how long? The, the duration of my pre professional career, and now I gotta get back into it. Yeah. Not the professional career, but like my life career. And uh, so it was very difficult to, to figure out what am I going to do with the skills that I have. You know, some people care, some people don't care. Like, okay, I went from, from my first job interview at the bank. Like, okay, so you graduated from university in 2000. It's 2010. What have you been doing for the last 10 years? Oh, I've been playing professional football. Okay, cool. What else have you been doing? Mm -hmm. And like, you just dismiss it as if it never happened. And that's not, I don't blame them, but it's like this person just dismissed 10 years or eight years as a professional, which I've dedicated my entire life to. So I have this skill set that's up here, PhD level, that has zero relevance in this world. It's like, what can you do for me at this point? Like exactly. football is not gonna do anything for our, our company. Exactly, yeah. you know, like, oh, that's great, good. And what else? Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, I mean, I worked this little job here, this job, but none of those translate, mm -hmm. right? So I went from being ahead of the game financially mm -hmm to now I'm right back at zero at 32 years old and the bank's like, well, how about you start off as a bank teller? <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. So you went from being served on to being a servant. Like that must have been a, a mind twist. Yeah, it was. It was a real um, awakening. And, you know, the value that I pulled from that though was the ability to, you know, remake, reshape, remodel myself and, you know, upgrade myself. And secondary was that's a s skill set that I can, or an experience that I can use with the guys and girls that I work with now. Mm. Don't go through that. Yeah, yeah. So now you have this gym for over 10 years that you've been, just like football, putting your all into. What kind of rewards are you reaping? Obviously, you're getting paid for clients, cool, but I would think the thought of helping people like you say not make the same mistakes that you're making specifically to athletes how has that reward been for you just like over 10 years of this now yeah uh it's been uh is if i mean it's encapsulated in in one word it's it's been truly humbling and and i don't mean that in the just oh i'm humbled I'm, like i mean it seriously humbling to think that you know, you have or are in a position to have, you know, an impact on somebody's coming back from an injury, um, you know, trying to find that 2% increase in their performance, taking somebody who has no athletic ability and now all of a sudden giving them confidence to go and perform athletically at a decent to high level. You know, um, a young kid that, you know, doesn't care about school, doesn't really see his future, can't identify with any positive role models around him to be able to pull that kid and say, hey, let's find what skills you do have and let's start to shine that and figure out a way and help that kid find his, his, uh, his calling or, um, you know, take a guy who's like me, who's done playing who's let his body go, who's mentally, you know, not transitioned well, to say, hey, like, you had a standard, let's reestablish re -establish what the standard is and get you back up to there, you know? So there's all these different scenarios that, you know, filter back that I don't think I really honestly had the, the time or made the time to stop and even think about it until probably two or three years ago. Um, and starting to realize, you know, these impacts that I've that I've had the opportunity to have on people, 
um, you know, or people, you know, saying when it's all said and done, hey, coach just wanted to say thank you. And I'm like, for what, you know? And yeah. they're like, no, thanks for these things that you've instilled in me that I've carried through. And these are sometimes, you know, guys that I haven't seen for four years, five years, right? That all of a sudden are saying this. And I'm like, oh, wow, like you never, you, I didn't know that that's what you took from what we did five years ago, six years ago, you know? And now because I'm, you know, more seasoned, uh, a more seasoned veteran in the game, if I could say that, that I'm also now seeing the cycles go through with the athletes, like kid that, you know, I had that was 14 years old, showing up with, you know, a broken ankle saying, coach, I just want to play next year to now that kid's gone through his adolescence graduated, went to university, graduated, and is now drafted. And, you know, been working with him through all of that is pretty rewarding, you know? Man. So, obviously, now, during the pandemic, you've had to make some transitions just like everybody else. Mentally and physically, what are some things that you can give advice to for people who are not able to get into the gym every day, um, still maybe able to work with you, but not at the same level. I know obviously you've taken on some challenges of your own of like staying focused and keeping actively fit. What is some advice that you'd give to those people? Uh, that's a tough one because, uh, you know, this has been a very challenging time for everybody and everybody has advice. Everybody has here's the five things you need to do here's the three things you need to do here's the 10 steps and it's all it's this it's all people trying to offer positivity which is great mm -hmm. but the truth of the matter in my eyes is it really boils down to everybody we're really finding out our individualism right now mm -hmm. is what i think and you know some people respond well to being pressed some people respond better to letting them be um, and then there's everything in between and uh, you know what I've had to find for myself is is this is the first time in years that I've actually really focused on myself and saying like well what how are you operating because the mental stress and challenge and pressure that it's put on like I feel it also mm -hmm. you know and when you know you're you're leading a group of people, and I say group of people, the people in my community, um, you know, through strength training and, and uh, athletic development, and they're looking at you for the answer, and like I don't know, I don't have the answer. But the question is, why do I not have the answer? And then I take a deeper look within, right? And whether so. You know, reading books has been different for me now. You know, listening to a podcast has been different. It's, and I found is, is finding what that connection is to the things that you do and that stimulate you, that inspire you, is you've got to find that and where that connection is. You know, and like you and I spoke a couple of weeks ago about it, and it's like I almost got to go backwards a little bit because I know I'm connected to like working hard for me. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, creating that game plan and like, yeah, you can't get into the gym and get under weights and do all that stuff, which is it's brutal. It's brutal from a business standpoint, obviously, but I'm not even talking about that aspect. I'm talking about the people. It's brutal that you can't get into the gym and connect because it's so much more than just the lifting the weights, right? It's just the camaraderie. It's the, you know, you and me are going to work out on a Saturday morning and that means, okay, I know I got to come correct because EK is coming correct this weekend. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you and I will push each other. Like, that's where the value is. And now all of a sudden that's not the same thing because now you and I are having these connections through a, a text message yeah, or whatever, yeah. right? It's not quite the same. But working on, on yourself and so finding it, for me, was that connection of that hard work. So how am I going to do that? Well. I'm going to just start, you know, doing my push-ups again and going for my walks. And I'm going to do that every single day. And that's going to be what my challenge is. Is it replaced the gym? Definitely not. Does it, you know, all of a sudden mean everything's going to be all roses? Definitely not. But it's, I've got to continue to move. And I've got to continue to move forward, right? And it's so funny or, or interesting that <clears throat> here we are. And for me, it's like, again, another, you know, 
um, situation that is like it see it's it forces you to evolve it forces you to change it forces you to check yourself and we're so caught up and so busy so consumed with so many things now by the, just the nature of what life is that we've gotten so far from self-development we all talk about it you know but how many people read self-help books and nothing changes and now it's about connecting to what am I reading? You know, you had given me that 50 cent book, um, Hustle Harder, that I, uh, that I just finished. And, you know, you gave that to me. It was over a year ago. And I didn't, I never got into it. Yeah. Now I'm like reading it, reading it and trying to really connect to it and being like, okay, here's a game plan, for example, of executing. Just execute these principles as opposed to, okay, I read that, cool, now I'm going to read the next one. I'm going to read the next one. And, you're, you know, and you just keep reading them, but you're not executing anything. Why do you think it's so hard for self-accountability? You know, you talk about going to the gym and the thought of working out on a Saturday is, okay, the first thing you said was because someone else is going to show up, so I have to come correct. Why is it not the self-talk of I'm going to show up and whoever's not coming like forget them or they have to come to my level why is it another person first and never ourself when it comes to those type of conversations because we're lazy mm. we're all lazy we're naturally lazy <clears throat> and the people that you're talking about are those you know few and far between that <clears throat> um have the ability to trigger up that inspiration inside because of what that vision is and the strength of their vision. And I, truth, I truly believe that um, it's that strength of what the vision is. And that's why the stronger that your vision is, and I've talked about this before, and it's, it's what I talk about you know, with um, the people that I mentor as well, is your vision has to be strong, whatever it is, and that that's what's going to get you inspired to do what you got to do which is why motivation to me and you you know you could talk about we could sit here and talk for three hours about motivation inspiration motivation is so momentary right it's like hey you know what okay you got to like tighten things up i want you to do this let's do it right now you're going to be good to go and we're going to go and roll but tomorrow at the same time if i'm not here or you know are you going to be able to do that again but what will have you do that again is that inspiration of trying to achieve what your vision is and that's where that difficult part for me was, is I, my vision always was, okay, I'm gonna make, become a professional athlete. So no matter what was happening, that, what you talked about that example, for me, I, I drew <clears throat> my fire off of the fact that people weren't doing it. You know, when I get up at 4.30 in the morning and I'm knocking on the door of my roommates, being like, hey, let's go run now, let's go run now. Like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to. That's fueled me to go and do it because come hell or high water, I was going to be a professional athlete in my head. Mm -hmm. And now I had to find a way to transition that now into business, career, fatherhood of how am I going to do that? You know what I mean? And so that's where that strength of vision really comes from. And it takes time to articulate that. It takes time to develop that. Um, but, you know, and that's going to change and evolve over time, mm -hmm. you know, but the strength, the strength of that has to come from that vision because that's what's going to get you up on those days where you know you don't want to do it all right so to close off accountability speaking of accountability in the next five years where can we see yourself whether it be your business or your newly found art career <laughs> where can we see you in the next five years if, if i'm operating on a high level well when I am operating on a high level, you won't see me. You'll feel me, but you won't see me. Okay, we'll end it like that. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll end it like that. No, no, no more questions. Uh, again, this is the manifest where we talk about to entrepreneurs, creatives about their their journey, and just hopefully we can serve as some sort of guidance. Whether you forty minutes to an hour, hopefully you can uh, take away some jewels. And we do appreciate you for coming on one of many conversations that has been on camera and hopefully more to come. So appreciate your time. Appreciate it. Respect. Right.